Mm. Coming up on DTNS, why the Department of Justice's shot at amending safe harbor might hit closer to the mark than you think. You can finally RTFM for a 75-year-old computer and Scott Johnson's thoughts on Blizzard co-founder Mike Morheim's new game company. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 23rd, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Shane. Man, it's, it's taken this long, but now I feel like I'm saying a bad word when I say 2020 in the date. Oh, like, like a little, I catch like myself. A swear. Like, should I be yeah. saying that? 2020. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I had such high hopes, too. <laughs> uh, we were just talking about uh, crocheters versus knitters and whether anything will ever replace Watergate uh, as a meme. Go get that wider conversation at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The GSMA announced that the next Mobile World Congress will be held in Barcelona from June 28th to July 1st, 2021. Mobile World Congress 2020 was one of the earliest tech events canceled due to COVID-19 back in February, and the GSMA had originally planned to hold a Mobile World Congress event in March of 2021. So Speaking of events, yeah, a little bit. Uh, Speaking of events that are being held, the 2020 Game Awards will stream live from Los Angeles, London, and Tokyo on December 10th airing in 4K UHD from in-studio locations with virtual fan participation. We'll see what that means in the long run. Across 45 global video platforms, there will be a new innovation in Excel accessibility award, rather, and the games uh, game festival that launched last year is also coming back. European antitrust regulators who have concerns about Google's planned acquisition of Fitbit now have until December 23rd to make a decision on their antitrust probe. Uh, if you recall, Google announced its intention to buy Fitbit in November of 2019 for $2.1 billion. The European Commission is concerned that data gathered by Fitbit could thwart competition if Google acquires that data and further entrench Google's dominance in online ad markets. So again, they have until December 23rd. Samsung announced a more affordable version of the Samsung Galaxy S20 called the Fan Edition or S20 FE. It's plastic instead of glass on the back. Its rear cameras have fewer megapixels. And while it has 120 hertz refresh rate, it's not variable. Otherwise, the specs pretty much match the more expensive siblings. The Samsung Galaxy S20 FE will be available in five colors October 2nd for $699 or $749 for the millimeter wave version on Verizon. Microsoft will offer a standalone version of Microsoft Office. You may have heard of it in 2021 next year. No subscription required at all. It will be available for Windows and Mac, uh, but no price or specific date was released. Everybody thought they wouldn't do that again, but they are. Mm. Lenovo announced it will offer a large selection of ThinkPads and ThinkStations, about 30 of them, with Ubuntu Linux on them for the public. You could previously get Ubuntu on a ThinkPad or ThinkStation if you were an enterprise customer. The Ubuntu models will come with a full range of support as well. Adobe launched a feature for Acrobat Reader called Liquid Mode, which analyzes PDFs and then rebuilds them for viewing on mobile devices. Once completed, users will be able to adjust line spacing and font size locally or jump back to the original PDF if they so desire. Liquid Mode is rolling out on Android and iOS now with plans to eventually come to the desktop. That's pretty cool. Uh, YouTube will use machine learning to identify videos that should be age-restricted and require viewers to log into, uh, log into the service to verify your age. In some regions, that will mean looking at profile info, but under some legal, legal jurisdictions like the European Union, it may require scanning an ID or entering credit card information. During Tesla's battery day, Tesla announced the Plaid Model S. It's a Model S with 520 miles of range, zero to 60 in two seconds for $140,000. You can pre-order one now. They also announced a battery, the 4680, five times the energy, six times the power, 16% more range, as well as a reduction in cost per kilowatt of 14% per cell. But you use a bunch of cells to make a battery, so you're talking about some pretty good savings there. Separately, Tesla has sued the United States government over tariffs on parts Tesla imports from China. Tesla claims tariff lists three and four were arbitrary and capricious and wants them declared void and the amount Tesla paid refunded with interest. Hat tip to Big Jim for alerting us to the tariff story in our Discord. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, a trend uh, that you might want to pay attention to. TechCrunch reports research from Index Ventures, it has a new report out on Europe, 
uh, shows that fewer than one in 50 European tech firms are choosing to relocate their engineering base to the U.S. as they expand selling their product in the U.S. Now, if you're like, okay, what does that mean? It used to be standard practice to move at least your engineering squad to Silicon Valley in order to expand in the U.S., especially if you wanted to get some funding. So it usually happened before Series A. Between 2008 and 2014, 59% of European startups either expanded into or moved entirely into the United States ahead of Series A funding. That number fell to 33% between 2015 and 2019. Also, Stack Overflow reports that there are now 6 million professional developers living in Europe right now, compared to 4.3 million in the United States. So it's easier to find a developer in Europe if you stay there. And along with tightened immigration rules, that makes development costs in the U.S. more expensive. Seems to me that what this says to me, I'm, I'm no expert on any stretch of the word expert in this area, but it seems like maybe that just means some of the money or all the money isn't concentrated just here. Like that funding round's important, obviously, <clears throat> but it seems like maybe what's happening is Europe and other parts of the world are having concentrated amounts of investment happening on their own soil. So why make this giant move if you can make a go where you are? Well, it's well, not even just that, right? Yeah, go ahead, sir. Well, I was going to say, even in the U.S. itself, it used to be, well, if you want to be taken seriously, you got to move to Silicon Valley or at least have a presence there because, yeah, you're raising money and the engineers have to kind of all be together and collaborate. And that is just not the case anymore, particularly today, because we're all learning how to work remotely and still collaborate more than ever. So even, I would think even more so if there's a European tech firm that has, uh, you know, ha has a, a stable base somewhere it makes very little sense to move to the U.S. unless for some reason money was being withheld. Yeah, my, my take on this is you can still get those U.S. venture capitalists uh, to invest in your European firm. There's no reason you, I mean, once COVID is over, you, there's no reason you can't fly to Silicon Valley and take a meeting, right? right. Uh, but uh, if you're moving engineering there and now suddenly it costs you more to make your product, that's less compelling than if you have that meeting and say, oh, we're using uh, the more affordable and very talented developers in Europe. Uh, whereas before it was like, you got to move to engineering to the US. It's where the best developers are. Uh, and they're just as affordable, if not more affordable than the European ones. And that's just not true anymore. We've made it so that the US is pricier to operate in. Well, if you were wondering, whatever became of that July and August boycott of advertising on Facebook, remember? They, you know, everybody was wringing their hands. Oh boy, Facebook is really in trouble now. The Financial Times reports that Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and the World Federation of Advertisers have agreed on steps to curb harmful content online, which is why the boycott happened in the first place. The agreement includes common definitions for things like hate speech and bullying, along with standardized reporting. The platforms agreed to have some practice reviewed by external auditors and give advertisers more control over what content their ads can show up next to. I mean, this it seems like sounds a, good. Yeah, right. Like I, my <laughs> for my initial take is, oh, you it made a difference. Uh, there's some transparency and reporting happening. You want that? It'll get everybody back to what they really want, which is advertised to everyone all the time. Um, that's the business. That's literally the industry that was affected. And um, yeah, like if they're getting what they want, the the big question is this: Are they getting enough of what they think? their constituency of customers want out of Facebook so that they're, uh, how do I put this? So this doesn't just feel like a half measure or these advertisers say, look, we did, you know, we did something. We, we all made some pressure and now we got these concessions. Are the concessions good enough for them to stop feeling the pressure? I don't think we know yet. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's too early to, to tell how these things are in practice. Uh, and honestly, I don't look at this and say, well, that's it. They solved hate speech. Uh, it does feel more like they probably put in some things that will make a difference of some sort, but this is mostly done so they can point to the document and say, there, we did it, everyone. Uh, it, it feels more publicity oriented than effectually oriented, but that doesn't mean to say it will have no effect. I th but I, I think its biggest value is being able to say, we boycotted and got them to agree to a thing. Look at us, we did it. Yeah, a taste of a precedent. It mm. seems more like 
giving advertisers more control over what their content, uh, what content their ads show up next to, that's kind of the thing here. Being yeah. able to curb hate speech is a much larger issue, but, you know, step in the right direction. Yep. Sure. Well, Pinterest seems to be high-stepping in an interesting direction. Uh, they seem to be benefiting directly from iPhone users who found uh, new enthusiasm for widgets and customized home screens. Yeah, that's right, Android people. We know, we know. Uh, Aptopia reports Pinterest saw a record high number of daily downloads September 21st with 606,000. Sensor Tower reported 800,000 installs across iOS and Android combined on September 20th, a 32% jump week over week. And Pinterest climbed from number 47 on the iOS uh, free app chart to number six, which is a huge jump on September 21st and to number five on September 23rd. Uh, iPhone design trends is showcased in the Pinterest homepage. Pinterest told TechCrunch it has seen an increase in searches for iOS 14 wallpaper and home screen design among Gen Z users. Pinterest also launched a new content type called Story Pins in beta. Uh, this allows users to combine multiple pages of images, uh, videos, voiceover, and overlaid text. Yeah, I, I found the story fascinating because uh, we talked on a previous show about how, you know, IS users, much to the, you know, delight of Android users who've always had widgets, uh, are discovering widgets and doing some really fun stuff with their iPhone home screens. Uh, and Pinterest is feeling the effect of that. Pinterest is getting a surge. Not that Pinterest wasn't popular, right? But it had a jump from number 47 to number six to number five. Uh, in the space of a week. Uh, that's a bunch of people rediscovering Pinterest and they're launching this new content type that's kind of a stories for Pinterest, very Snapchatty uh, at the same time. So this is this is an interesting side effect that I don't think anyone would have predicted uh, before the launch of iOS 14. Yeah, I know yeah. Pinterest is wildly popular. I I I have a Pinterest board um, and I pin things. It's usually like if I'm like, I want to rearrange my living room. I need some inspiration kind of thing. I'm not going there on a daily basis, but it does serve a really good purpose for inspiration and design. And it's kind of funny that the home screen for iOS users, people want, I need some inspiration. You know, I need, I need to see what the cool kids are doing and, and I'll be able to recreate that like an interior designer myself. Yeah. And I would have guessed, I would have guessed like Reddit or a, a lot of other places before. Yeah. Right, right. I don't know why. Um, part of it is I have a bias. My wife loves Pinterest and I've always thought of it as quote unquote, putting my fingers up the lady internet. I know it isn't okay. Everybody calm down. Don't send your emails to Tom. <laughs> But there's always been this feeling of like, well, I don't really belong there because it's all interior design and like draperies and stuff. That's what I thought. Turns out it's full of all kinds of stuff, great art and other things. And there's no reason why they uh, couldn't benefit from this since they're the kind of format they are. But uh, I turned to my wife before the show and said, hey, we're going to talk about Pinterest today and what's happening. And she says, well, I liked them before they were cool. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and lots of different kinds of people like interior design. And, and it strikes me, Sarah, with what, what you're saying, uh, that this is a kind of interior design, right? It's mm -hmm. like, man, I've, I've rearranged my living room as many times as I can handle during this lockdown. Uh, now I got something new uh, to play with. And I, well, I think that's and part of it, too. Yeah, the the home screen on iOS always just looked the same. Sure, you can rearrange things, make some folders, but it just it looked the same. So I don't think people really thought a whole lot about it. It just if there was an iOS redesign, then it would change, you know, sort of a little bit. Mm -hmm. But this is sort you know, finally for the first time, us iOS users and yes, Android users continue to chuckle. Uh, or, you know, you kind of look over and go, oh, Tom's home screen looks really cool. How'd you do that? Mm -hmm. I want to I want to do that, too. And I, and I say, well, that's my Microsoft Surface Duo you're looking at. Yeah. <laughs> and then I slink away and go back to Pinterest. Uh, no, we always knew that Scott's wife was cooler than cool, and now it's proven. Proven. Uh, the U.S. Department of Justice proposed legislation that would amend Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Uh, that's the one we often refer to as safe harbor. The DOJ's bill says that platforms can't be held liable for filtering content that violates their terms of service. But... The reverse of that in this proposal is that they then could be held liable for filtering content if it didn't violate their terms of service. It also says when Internet companies, quote, willfully distribute illegal material or moderate content in bad faith, Section 230 should not shield them from the consequences of their actions. 
It includes a provision to allow victims of these criminal acts to sue the platform in those cases, and it proposes mechanisms for transparency over moderation practices. It refines definitions to provide more guidance to courts and provides incentives to address illicit content. Uh, like many other proposals, it replaces the phrase otherwise objectionable content in the original Section 230 with specific categories, including promotes terrorism, violent extremism, self-harm, etc. Now, the bill is trying to address two problems. Censoring speech, which is the you can't filter the stuff that doesn't violate your terms of service, and allowing criminal activity. That's the part where it says, hey, you can't be willfully out there distributing illegal material. That's targeted at the backpage.coms of the world, the, the nefarious sites that say, hey, but we're Section 230. We didn't know they were you know, putting these nefarious things on our, on our content site. The criminal activity issue became a problem in the first challenge to Section 230 way back in 1997, Zarin versus AOL. Up until that point, a 1959 case about a bookstore owner had set the legal principle that if you were the distributor of a content, you were only liable for illegal content if you knew you were distributing it, and not bookstore owners were not assumed to know the contents of every book they sold. And Section 230 said, let's call these internet companies distributors, not publishers, of the content that people post on their platforms. Zarin versus AOL ruled that Section 230, quote, creates a federal immunity to any cause of action that would make service providers liable for information originating with a third-party user of the service. That is a stricter protection than the 1959 case. The 1959 case said, but if you do know what's in the book and you distribute it, well, then you're liable. Now, they were saying, look, you're you're not liable to anything that a third party posts on your site. And that has caused a lot of these problems. So instead of having to take it down once you know about it, internet services can be given a broader shield. And the DOJ seems to directly address that by putting in the language about willful distribution, saying, hey, let's go back to if we can show you knew it was there, then you're liable for it. But the Zarin decision also said, Faced with potential liability for each message republished by their services, interactive computer service providers might choose to severely restrict the number and types of messages posted. That's the whole fundamental of Section 230. Like, if we don't give them broad protection, they won't allow vibrant speech to happen. By pairing the willfully clause with the anti-censorship rules, the bill now moves sites into a form of prior restraint to protect themselves against making the wrong decisions. You don't want to allow the illegal posts up in case someone can argue you willfully distributed it, but you can't pull posts down in case someone argues you censored them outside of your terms of service. So one solution would be to restrict who and what goes up to make it easier to defend. In other words, let fewer posts up or give yourself wide terms that say, we can pull anything down for any reason we want. And that was one of the problems that Section 230 was trying to address in the first place. Seems to me that whenever you talk about stuff like this, uh, I get a funny feeling in my head about how smart all this sounds and how little I understand about it. So <laughs> I just want to thank Tom, you know, from Salt Lake City today for once again helping me understand. I mean, weird. it sounds a little darned if you do, darn if you don't. Uh, as a platform, it's like, okay, well, if I somehow get filtered out, but I didn't do anything wrong, then I can come after you because that's wrong. But if I do something bad and you keep it up, well, they can come after you because that's wrong. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's restricting users, I don't know, having some sort of, I don't know, user rating or, you know, vetting process kind of thing. That I, I think you just need to legislate only, don't, don't add the anti-censorship thing in there. I think it's a red herring. I know some people disagree with me and maybe they're right, but I think you legislate on that Zarin case to say, look, if we can show you knew it was illegal and it was on your platform, you're still liable. I think that gets rid of so many of these problems. That's just, I'm not a lawyer, not a legislator, but that's my take. Well, the world's oldest surviving digital computer is probably older than you think. It's the 32-bit Z4, completed in 1945. It runs on tape, takes up a room in the Duchess Museum in Munich, and needs several people to operate it, because it's old. It hasn't been used in some time, but that may be about to change, since an archivist at ETH Zurich, Evelyn Bosch, discovered the Z4's manual in March among some of her father's documents. Renee Bosch 
worked with the Swiss Aeronautical Engineering Association and used the Z-4 in the development of the P-16 jet fighter. The Z-4 was built in Germany by a team led by German civil engineer Konrad Zuse between 1942 and 1945, who likely wrote the manual. It was then evacuated from Berlin in February of 1945 to Göttingen, where it was completed, then transferred again to southern Bavaria to avoid the advancing front. Work resumed on it in 1949, and then it was sold to ETH Zurich's Institute for Applied Mathematics in 1950. It was then transferred to the museum in 1960, where it lays today. And now we have the manual back, so we can turn it back on. Yeah, fire that thing up. Yeah. <laughs> Let's uh, you see know. what secrets it holds. Yeah, enter, a lot. The, enter the world of esports finally there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Z4. And, and when when Sarah mentioned 32 bits, uh, it's important to note that's it entirely 30. Like those were all it had 32 bits for the whole computer. It wasn't a 32 bit system like we have now. Like yeah, that was processing. it. Yeah, 32 bits to work with. Yeah, no you don't more. have you're not floating 32 bit processing over everything you do. This was literally the yeah. breadth and width of the thing. But what a cool document to time. Like what a great thing that is. I love it. I hope that every computer as old or old uh, you know even the stuff from the 60s and 70s, we should just treat that stuff like it like the 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 old uh, artifact that it is and dust them off and put them in a safe place and historically take care of this stuff it's kind That's, of amazing that this thing survived world war ii like it was being built while germany was falling essentially yeah. Yeah. uh there's a possibly apocryphal story about uh zeus being ordered to take it to a concentration camp and he said no uh and and took it elsewhere to a barn to, to keep it from getting bombed uh but but whether that's true or not uh it is amazing that this thing survived and now has the manual and everything like it's worth so much more with the manual i wonder if they have the original packing I doubt it. The foam's gone. You got to get new foam. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Blizzard CEO and co-founder Mike Morheim left Blizzard in 2018. Uh, he stayed on as a consultant for about a year or so, but he has now unveiled his new company called Dreamhaven, a game developer and publisher. Dreamhaven has two internal studios, one called Moonshot Games and the other called Secret Door. Moonshot is headed by former Hearthstone lead Jason Shays, StarCraft II director Dustin Browder, and Hearthstone creative director Ben Thompson. Secret Door is led by Chris Sigety, uh, who was an executive producer on Hearthstone, Alan DeBeery, technical director on Warcraft 3 and StarCraft 2, and Eric Dodds, who was a designer on World of Warcraft and StarCraft. Uh, we have the guy who does the biggest Blizzard podcast on the planet uh thankfully on this show on wednesdays so i could not pass up the opportunity to ask scott what do you think of this this feels like mike morheim saying let's make a new blizzard in a very real way it is a lot of people at first you know how things go with names people try to digest the name and try to figure out what it means or whatever to me it was very obvious right away that this may have been a small reference to hey those dreams that we have for amazing games and experiences that are based purely on creativity and art We'd like to make a haven for that. And Dreamhaven is, I think, the perfect uh, name for it. Blizzard has a very storied uh, history, <clears throat> part of which has been slightly muddied in the last decade, a little less than that maybe, where more and more it's a corporation with uh, the need to satisfy um, shareholders and less and less a place for creatives to go and build out their vision. And while much of their culture still persisted and certainly their games reflected that focus on on quality it was clear from inside and outside that things were i don't know a little tension heavy between the parent company now activision and blizzard and trying to kind of pay both those masters if you will and in the end people like morheim and before him chris metzen and before him dustin browder who ends up uh, now with morheim again if anyone was wondering where he ended up he's he's amazing but all of these guys and girls who were just like, yeah, I'm, I need to move on. I needed to go try something else. And a lot of them started other companies. Rob Pardo left and started Bonfire Games with Josh Mascara and a bunch of artists and other folks from Blizzard. A very similar thing. He was also uh, at the time. Well, at the time, he was one of the head executives of the of the of Blizzard. It took about a year where he didn't hear anything, and then that NDA lifted and they started another company. Nobody knows what they're working on, but this is a lot like that. So right now, between those two, uh, those two companies, these two sub-companies under the Dreamhaven name, plus uh, Second Dinner 
and probably countless other developers who have left and started other projects, you're now starting to see this thing where the thing that was Blizzard has sent all these little pieces off into directions, and now we get to see what they can make on their own. In Morheim's case, it's exciting because it seems like he's getting to start over and start over in a way that's very meaningful because, A, he's the funding now, and he's got plenty to do it. He doesn't have to rely on third parties, doesn't have to join up with different uh, groups. The company's always kind of been beholden to, to the people with the money, um, and so this gives him a chance to not have to have that hanging over his, his back. He gets to kind of have his pick of what creative people he wants there, and they get to just go to town and make games. One thing to note, though, like with all big game startups, you're not going to hear anything about actual games for a good couple of years out of this company, I don't think. Um, they may beat, uh, I, have a, I have a little side bet going, that they may beat Bonfire to the market with an actual video game to play. Um, I could be wrong about that, but the point is that these things take time. It's like Microsoft when they bought all their studios. We still haven't seen the fruition of that yet, although we're getting closer and closer. Um, so we've got work to do, and there will be time to spend on wondering what they're going to do. But I have no doubt, given their pedigree and given the, just the skill sets at hand, this will be a, a big deal. And, and it's interesting to see, you know, he could have taken vacations until the end of time, Tom. That would have been the end of anything we heard of, of Morheim. He just would have had all the time with his kids and his vacations and his wife and his fun and his, and his good times that he earned all those years. I think he really has it in his heart to just sort of keep making these kinds of games and experiences. And personally, as someone who's followed this stuff for 15 years, I am really stoked about it. Can't wait to see what they do. It's uh, it's the the uh, the George Lucas effect that he has to avoid because there is no check mm -hmm. on Mike Morheim now. Right. Uh, and and you know a lot of people's theory on George Lucas and Star Wars is he made his best Star Wars when he had people telling him he couldn't do things and he had to figure out ways to do them anyway. Whereas once he had full control. He made things that you know some people have issues with. And, yeah, and, and that's a that's a really good need point. Need people who can tell you no. He's bringing in a lot of folks that he's worked with before. Maybe they're the kind of folks who'll tell him no. Well, and also the way they've structured it, having these two separate companies mm -hmm. uh, underneath this one, Moonshot, and what was the other one? I already forgot it. Uh, Secret Door. Secret Door. There it is, Secret Door. Those two companies are filled with people that are used to being in really big leadership positions, calling shots on both design, execution, what's the plan, what are we doing, what is this game, what are we doing with all our people? Like those names alone make me think that he he knows this and by organizing them, almost giving them their own studio, their own sub studio under the company name is a way of him saying, please take all that you have and put it toward this. I'm just going to kind of be here cheerleading everything and, mm. and making stuff. And he's not going to make the kinds of decisions that would curb their creativity. That's what I think, whether whether that happens or not, or whether the, this George Lucas effect you talked about happens or not is time will tell, but I kind of hope not. And I really am pulling for these guys because Mike yeah. literally truly one of the nicest dudes in the industry. And he, he deserves, uh, you know, a, a cool next chapter in his life. Tune into the instance for more. Yep. Well, if you have thoughts on Moonshot or anything else on your mind, join the conversation in our Discord. It's a lively bunch. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. I said tune in, even though it's not radio, and now I'll say mailbag, even though it's not letters. What's in <laughs> it? Uh, in fact, it's Twitter. Techie Goob on Twitter <laughs> wrote in to our Daily Tech News Show uh, account and said, Widget Smith, which is uh, an, an app that Patrick Beja was talking about yesterday to make widgets for iOS. Widget Smith only has a subscription for the weather and tide information that come from a third party. The rest of the app is actually free. Because Patrick was saying, well, it's a subscription. That's a little bit silly, just for a bunch of widgets. Uh, turns out Widget Smith Premium includes hosted data sources, and currently that includes weather and tides. Also, some exclusive widget styles. So, if you really like one, you might be paying for it. One ninety nine per month or nineteen ninety nine per year. Uh, yeah, but that's a good point, uh, Techie Goob. Uh, you you can just use it to make some widgets without paying anything. So we should have made that clear. Appreciate the correction. Uh, and then Rob in Toronto doesn't want to use Widget Smith or anything else. He sent us a screenshot. We asked for screenshots of our phones, and Rob was like, I will not be using widgets to organize my iPhone home screen. I have it just the way I've wanted it for years. I created folders based on the source or purpose of many of my apps and placed them inside accordingly. Easy to find whatever I need. Yes, I know some people have totally disorganized phones. That may not change, even with widgets. Get a little preachy there at the end, Rob. That may not change, even with widgets in iOS 14. Rob, I... 
I'm with you mostly. Although after the show yesterday, because I was like, you know, maybe I I need to try a little bit harder. I do have some widgets on my home screen today. And I was like, okay, I just needed to delve into some of my options a little bit further. Like I got a Fantastical widget now. And I was like, ah, that's so cool. I just didn't even know I wanted it until I saw it. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Mike McLaughlin, Mike McLaughlin, sorry, a frog in my throat, Miss Music Teacher, and Justin Zellers. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson. Scott Johnson, what's been going on over the last week? Well, uh, as people know, during this season of Current Geek Chronicles, which launched uh, four episodes ago, now oh, five, because the fifth was landed uh, or put out today, um, I'm going to talk a lot about that on Wednesday. So, Go get the latest episode. We talk about the reality of reality TV. That sounds a little meta. Well, it is. We talk to some editors, writers, creators, and ourselves about the world of reality TV, how it works, why it works, and uh, how you're being manipulated or maybe how you're not being. It's a lot of that stuff for you to decide, but uh, it's a great episode. We're loving this season, and uh, go get it right now. It's at Current Geek Chronicles, wherever you get your podcasts, or you can find it at currentgeek.com. And everything else I got going on, you can find over at frogpants.com and on Twitter at Scott Johnson. Monday, October 5th starts Creators Theme Week. It's uh, just about a week away, a week from Monday. We look at how technology has changed and is still changing, how people create things like visual effects, costume and props, narrative game design. That's all coming up right here on Daily Tech News Show. So tell your friends. It starts Monday, October 5th, uh, and you'll get it. First at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. If you want to send us an email, well, we have an email address, turns out. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. I'm off tomorrow, but Rich Straffolino will be here along with Justin Robert Young, and they will talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>